Hello everyone and welcome back to the continuation of the lectures in the finite element method brought to you by the civil engineering essentials channel and in this video we're going to continue our look on a book called the first course in the finite element method by Daryl L. Logan and we're going to deal with chapter 4 which is going to develop the basically the beam equations so today we're going to derive very quickly the beam equations we're gonna basically take a look on beam assemblage and just check out a very quick example. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. Okay, so what is a beam? In the context of the finite element method, a beam is basically an element that has transversal loads that are much more significant than its axial loads. And in this case, well, the significant internal forces it will have here is basically the shear force and the bending moment, and that's assumption of beams. Now, we're gonna derive those things. So first of all, before we derive anything, we need to understand the assumption of the positive directions in the finite element method, and they look like this. In the finite element method, well, uh, positive x, we know what it is, positive y, we know what it is, and the rotation is counterclockwise positive. Now, before we continue, I want to very quickly add that the finite element method assumption is different than the statics, the bending moment diagram and shear force diagram assumptions, and this will become relevant later. And the shear force and bending moment assumptions, um, basically, if you decide to take a look on this side, you would have counterclockwise and shear down, and if you decide to look on this side, you would have clockwise and shear up as being the positive directions for the shear force diagram and the bending moment diagram, and this will become significant later. We, we shall continue with this. Now, of course, here I am relying on you understanding and remembering your structural analysis courses in which we had the general principle of EI, uh, fourth derivation of the curve, elastic curve, uh, is gonna equal to zero. Now please notice that you can solve this analytically by quadruple integrating and providing all kinds of boundary conditions. And uh, the finite element method doesn't solve this directly, but it solves this numerically. Now in our case, it might be accurate enough, but in other cases it might not be, and we will understand the terms of accuracy when we deal with meshes in surface areas. But for now, well, we wanna uh, derive our finite element uh, stiffness. So selecting the element type is done because the element is a beam. Going to step two, we're gonna select the displacement function and the displacement function is gonna be a cubic equation. First of all, why polynomial? We discussed this in one of our previous lectures, why we use polynomials in, uh, the, in the displacement function. Something about continuity and so on. And why is it cubic? Well, because think about it. What are the things that you want to find in a beam? You want to find uh, the rotation at the node and the movement at the node of number two and the rotation and the movement of node number one. So you have four degrees of freedom, which means that you can, if you know the displacements of the nodes, then you can solve this if it has four unknowns because you have four degrees of freedom. How do you find A1, A2, A3, and A4? Well, this is not really hard because we know that at x equals zero, the deflection is going to be the deflection of node number one. At x equals the length of the element, the deflection is going to be the deflection at node number two, and so on. And you can see those boundary conditions being attached here. You can see that the deflection at x equals zero equals v1, which will give you a four. Why? Because if you plug in x equals zero in the equation, everything is dead unless a four. I mean, take a look. a1 multiplied by zero is zero. a2 multiplied by zero is also zero a3 multiplied by 0 is 0, and a4 is known. Similarly, you need to continue using your boundary conditions. What else do you know? You know, that the, you know the rotation of the node number 1. Based on that, you know the value of the derivative at that node, which means that you should derive it. Now, if you derive this very quickly, the derivative here is going to equal um, a1 multiplied by 3x squared plus a2 multiplied by 2x, plus a3. And if you know the rotation at the beginning of the element at x equals zero, well then this is dead, this is dead, and the only thing that survives is a3, which means that phi1 equals a3, and that's what you see here. Similarly, you can plug in the deflection at L to find a4 or whatever, uh, to find a3 and a2. You need to plug in the deflection at the end as well as the rotation at the end, which would give you the values of a1, a2, a3, and a4, and you can see this is a1, 
this is a2, this is a3, and this is a4. Now, why, why do we care about this? We care about the, because we care about this because the ultimate goal is to find the shape functions or the interpolation functions or the mixing functions, meaning that I want to find out the, the, uh, the movement at any point by saying n multiplied by d, and that's exactly what happens right now. Like v equals n multiplied by d, what's d? d are the nodal displacements, what's n? n are basically those mixing functions, and you can see this here. Those are called interpolation functions. Um, basically, uh, what it means here is that if you know, if you solve the finite element method problem, and you know the values of the deflection at the nodes, then you are able to find the deflections at any point on the beam at a distance x by using those mixing functions. The, keep this tabbed, because that's how Autodesk Robot and any structure analysis software does those curves. It's not just, it just does those cool curves by using those interpolation functions. That's really beneficial for programming standards. Now we have our mixing functions, but we're not finished because we need to find the strain displacement and stress strain um, equations. Now here I will rely on your understanding of mechanics of material that sigma equals mc over i or negative moment multiplied by y over i, where if you have a cross section, i is the inertia around the rotation axis and y is the perpendicular distance to that axis. Also, I rely on you on structures to know something called the double integration method, which says that the moment equals ei second derivative v over dx. It means basically that the moment equals ei, the curvature of the elastic curve. Also, we know that shear is the, in shear is the derivative of moment. That's something we should know. Now let's basically find the element stiffness matrix. Now what is this stuff? What is happening here? What's the point? Or I want to uh, relate the movements with the forces. That's my mission now. I want to relate all kinds of movements with all kinds of forces. And how do I do that? Well, first of all, you can see that, for example, let's take a look here. Let's just try understand this without looking at the slide. And understand this from, understand this from basic principles. So F1 seems to be going up. And we just agreed that the sign convention looks like this for the positive shear and moment. And you can see that F1 coincides with the positive shear and F2 is opposite of the positive shear. So I can say that F1 equals the shear at one and F, sorry, Y, and F2Y equals negative shear at two. Also, I know that moment at one equals negative moment diagram because moment diagram goes clockwise and this moment goes counterclockwise, so that's negative. And this one goes counterclockwise, this one goes counterclockwise, so that's positive. So if you look here very quickly, you can see this in action, the signs. The second thing that happens is you see that, for example, M1 is going to equal negative EI to the fourth or the second derivative over dx. Why? because m equals ei second derivative. So if you talk about m1, you're gonna use the second derivative of the four of the displacement at v1. But wait, we need v as a function of x to be able to derive, right? And you can see a derivative here done very quickly. So do we know, the question is, do we know v as a function of x? Yes, we know. We know v as a function of x because v, v equals the shape functions or the interpolation functions or the mixing functions multiplied by the nodal displacements and those are functions of x. So you have to derive this, derive this, derive this to x and derive this to x. Or you can just go back to the original and just derive this big, this big expression to x. But of course nobody does that. So well, we're using the shape function derivatives and that's what you see here. After deriving the shape functions, you can just plug in uh, x equals zero to find the, uh, basically the relationship between the shear at the start, sorry, between the force vertical at the start and the different nodes, as well as moment start, uh, force end, moment end. And you can see this, of course, called the stiffness matrix because it gives you the relationship between local forces and local displacement. This is called the stiffness matrix. Okay. Now, there, this is basically the stiffness matrix based on the assumptions of Bernoulli, uh, or Bernoulli. Uh, those are assumptions that, for example, a plane, uh, that the plane surface remains plane after bending and that the strain is linear. Those are basically good assumptions that we can 
get away with as long as our beams are not deep beams. Now, if you are an MSC or PhD level, you have to understand something called the Timoshenko beam theory. Now, robot doesn't do that, as far as I know, the school robot, but it's in the textbook available. This is basically calculating a little bit more deeper and assuming deeper assumptions for uh, in com when compared to Bernoulli. So Timoshenko seems to be deeper, and this is an absolute must if you're an MSc or PhD student. Just read the book and you will understand it. Okay, so we have an assemblage and example, right? Because we want to finalize our, our lecture with an assemblage and example. So what do you have here? We have a propped cantilever beam, meaning a cantilever with a roller. And he wants us to, well, find the stiffness matrix and solve, basically. Like, we want to find the displacement here and maybe the rotation at 2. And then we want to find some, uh, like, some shear and moments. Now, before I start, I didn't talk about transformation matrices, right? Well, uh, look, when you look at the beam, you immediately, immediately realize you don't need any transformation matrix because the global x-axis and the local x-axis of each of those beams coincide, so there is no uh, transformation matrix. Of course, if I want to read your mind, I mean, what happens if they don't? Like, if you have a frame like this, where you have the global x and y, yes, this coincides, but no, this doesn't coincide. Because if this doesn't coincide, we have to transform this in the transformation matrix. And that's something we're going to do in frames. So I'm basically being Yuri from the Red Alert 2. Good times. Okay, so now we are pros once again. I want to dive immediately into it. Element number one connects node one with two. Element number two connects node two with three. You can see this, of course, here in the drawing. Uh, that's element number one, that's element number two, and this connects one with two, this connects two with three. So the local stiffness matrix of element number one is, well, the, the matrix. It's EI, L over L cube, 12, 6, L, and so on. Those are just factors. Notice that you have, of course, once again, four quadrants. Uh, this is node number one, this is node number two in the columns. This is node number one, this is node number two in the blocks. Similarly, for the second stiffness matrix, you have node number two with node number three here, node number two with node number three, of course. That's a cute example. We will have much more dangerous examples in the future. Now we need to assemble this, hashtag engineer Khania. And uh, of course, we need to assemble the global stiffness matrix. I'm not doing this step by step because I've seen this a million times and there is nothing new I want to say here. Uh, basically, this is node number one with node number one, so the only thing you see is this. This is node number two with node number one, and the only thing you see is this. That's node number two with node number three, there is no connection, so there are zeros. That's node number two with node number two, so you see both this and this. This is node number two with three, so you see only this. And that's three with three, so you see only this. And I think we've done this a million times. It should be pros. How can I solve that? Well, what do I know? I know that node three is fixed and that node two is a roller. So I know that V2 is zero because roller and V3 and V3 are zero because fixed. So I can eliminate those things, basically, along with their columns. And what survives is a 3x3 three three matrix. This, 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 and this. Of course, the forces are known, and let me just go through very quickly. F1y is the force P going down. Take a look at this. P is going down. So at 1, you have a force going down negative, and you have a no moment. So force down, no moment. Here you have nothing, and here you have the reaction. So you can see that, well, when you apply your stuff, you can see that at node number 1, there is a force, but there is no moment, and at node number two, there is no moment. So you can solve this and find the displacements, which in turn can be used to find the forces which give you the reactions, and you can see that exactly here. So yeah, I mean, there is even more than this if you want to draw the moment diagram, but that's for something for next time. For now, I just wanted to cover very quickly how beams work in the finite element method. And you can see, I hope you can see, and I hope that you're getting bored, because you can see that from now on, it just follows a gimmick, you know? Like, there is something new in each lecture. I'm not gonna start over and over. Like, if you understood the previous lectures, then the new lectures should just be a matter of, like, dashing through them, just understanding what the difference is. And I'm trying to be a little bit abstract here because I told you before that I value your time and I want to condense knowledge 
as fast as I can without sacrificing, like, sacrificing accuracy. But wait, let's go deeper. After solving, we know what the node values are, we know what the force values are, so everything is fine. But wait, software is like Autodesk Robot, allow you to plot the, for example, displacement diagram or the rotation diagram, like a robot. If you right click on an element like a beam and select object properties, you can go to NTM and open its diagrams. Of course, for, for those of you who are not familiar with the robot, I have a cool um, playlist about the robot basics, which I'm gonna link on the top right. Robot is basically the professional and practical implementation of those lectures I teach here. Okay, so uh, how can I do that? How can I be like robot? Like, can I predict the deflection V and the rotation phi of each point on the uh, beam? And the answer is yes. And actually, my own software, Strado, does that. The idea is that if you have the uh, shape functions, which are a function of x, all you have to do is to input x. Let's say you want x1, meaning that I want the deflection at one meter away from the starting point of the beam. And all you have to do is just to plug in and find n1, n2, n3, and n4, and multiply by the nodal values. You want to find phi at one, for example? Well, first of all, you need to derive those because uh, phi is the derivation of v, slope is the derivation of displacement, so you have to derive those n functions, say dn1 over dx and so on, and then use the same thing, you have to use your x. And that's kind of cool, and what about the internal forces? That's for next time, but because there is a, like, there's a process involved to find the equation of moment and shear, and I might be talking about this next time. So yeah, that's everything I wanted to talk about today. It's, I know it's kind of an abstract lecture, but once again, I, was, I said before that I value time. I don't want to waste or take more time than necessary. So of course, before I end, I want to give a huge, whopping CEE-sized shout out to our dear channel members whose name is gonna be shown on the screen. I would like to thank each and every one of them for their support of the channel as their support allows me to produce more videos and really supports our efforts. So thank you very much from the deepest of my heart. Of course, in the end, I hope that this video was beneficial for you and that you enjoyed it. Of course, if you have enjoyed the video, then please like, share, comment, and subscribe, especially subscribing because it helps increase the reach of my channel. As per usual, this is the Civil Engineering Essentials channel and we'll catch you in the next video.